after this webinar, we will uh, have become very knowledgeable about the issue of the South China Sea and the uh, West Philippine uh, Sea, and that uh, we will uh, share the knowledge that we gain from this webinar to our families and to our friends. Any change must begin from the home. And if we can just uh, educate our clan members, then that's a good contribution already to our country's ability to address pressing and urgent needs. Good morning, uh, mga kababayan, mga kapatid. Come before the Lord in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we praise and thank you for freedom-loving Filipinos. Thank you, Lord, for this forum that you've given us to discuss at a high level with great respect, research, and credibility, a forum on uh, the West Philippine Sea issue. Thank you, Lord, for our guest speaker, Justice Carpio. We ask, Lord God, that you continue using him, guide him with your Holy Spirit, and guide all of us so that our hearts and minds be open to peaceful solutions and the ways by which we can get involved in our body politic in a way that will build up our democratic institutions here in our country. We pray and ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Magandang magandang uh, araw sa inyong lahat. Ito isang makasaysayang uh, araw at nakakatuwa na marami sa inyo ang sumagot dito sa paanyaya. Uh, alam naman ninyo na mahalagang mahalaga itong uh, issue na ito at mapalad tayo na meron tayong tagapagsalita na siyang pinakapangunahing tagapagtanggol ng ating pambansang uh, karapatan sa ating karagatan sa ilalim ng pandaigdigang kasunduan tungkol sa batas hinggil sa karagatan or unclos ang sumasagot sa Katangiang ito, walang iba kung hindi ang ating resource uh, person, si Justice Antonio uh, Carpio. Siya ang pinakamaraming beses na naging acting Supreme Court uh, Justice. Masasabi ko na siya ay, sa wikang Ingles, the best Chief Justice uh, we never had. Maraming beses na pwede siyang maging Chief Justice. I, I believe that the true measure of a person is when the person chooses principles and delicadesa over the highest honor that can be conferred on the person with regard to his chosen uh, profession. But he never wavered. He never wavered in uh, upholding his principles, his sense of delicadesa over this very, very important honor that can be bestowed on a person in the legal profession and in the judiciary. 2011 pa lamang nakita na ng ating resource person na ang bansang uh, China ay gumagawa na ng uh, kanyang kaparaanan to establish a de facto control over almost the entirety of South China Sea. Dahil dito, naghanda na rin siya at nagsalita tungkol dito sa napakalaking issue na uh, apektado ang ating karapatan sa ating sariling karagatan in our territorial waters at yung iba pa ipapaliwanag niya kung anong epekto nito sa tinatawag na continental shelf pati na sa ating mga manging isda. Hindi ko na palalawigin ang aking pagpapakilala sabagkat uh, uh, ang mas mahalaga marinig na natin ang kanyang paliwanag bagamat pinaalalahan na namin kayo na sana ay pinanood nyo na yung yung video sa YouTube but the preliminary remarks will still be given by our uh, uh, Justice uh, Tony Carpio. Maraming salamat Justice Tony. The floor is yours. Thank you Senator Joey. Thank you for inviting me this morning to discuss with you our sovereign rights in the West Philippine Sea. I hope that you have watched my YouTube video lecture. And uh, to add to that, I will just make a short presentation. So I will uh, now go to a PowerPoint presentation. You're familiar now with the 1734 Murillo Velarde map. And you will see the two dots there uh, showing on the top left the Scarborough Shoal and on the lower left the Los Baos de Paragua or the Shoals of Palawan, which are actually the Spratlys. It's in this map that the Scarborough Shoal and uh, the Spratlys were first given a name. 
So the first name of Scarborough Shoal was a Tagalog word, Panakot. And the first name given to the Spratlys was Los Baos de Paragua. But this was not the first map where the Spratlys and Scarborough Shoal appeared as part of Philippine territory. So let's go to the Spratlys. Uh, this is the 1657 map of Sanson. Nicolas Sanson is the father of French cartography and he made a map of the Philippines in 1657. And he included in this map the Spratlys without a name. The Spratlys as part of Philippine territory. And this is important because in 1933, the French annexed the Spratlys as part of the overseas territories of the French Union. In other words, France claimed the Spratlys as part of the French territory, not as part of the territory of Vietnam. So it was a claim by France that the Spratlys are, are part of the French Union, part of the overseas territory of France. But the French knew that since 1657, their cartographer, their official cartographer, already included the Spratlys as part of Philippine territory. So they cannot ignore this. When they claimed it, they said that nobody owned the Spratlys, but they should have known that the Spratlys, that the Spratlys belonged to the Philippines. In 1688, Father Coronelli made a map of the Philippines. Father Coronelli was the Father General of the Franciscan Order. The Franciscans arrived in the Philippines in 1578. So these religious orders would send regular reports to the Vatican, what were the events happening in the Philippines, what were the new islands occupied, the new names given to islands. And Father Coronelli made a map of the Philippines based on these reports. And clearly in the Palawan area, he included the Spratlys as part of the Philippines. He drew lines around the Philippines and the Spratlys are included within the lines. There's no older map from China or, the, or Vietnam showing that the Spratlys are part of their territory. We have the oldest map. So in 1734, Father Pedro Murillo Velarde included the Spratlys as part of Philippine territory and gave a name to the Spratlys, Los Baos de Paragua. How about in the Scarborough Show? In 1792, Alessandro Malaspina, uh, he was the head of the Spanish expedition, scientific expedition that went around the world to gather specimens of flora and fauna and to chart the uh, Spanish waters of the Spanish possessions. Uh, it was like sending a man to the moon. The British were the first to do it several years earlier by sending Captain Cook on a scientific expedition around the world, uh, gathered specimens of flora and fauna and to charge to the British waters in all their possessions. And Spain followed. And Alessandro Malaspina, the head of the expedition, came to Manila. And he was here on May 4, 1792. He went to Scarborough Show because Scarborough Show was very famous. In 1792, they knew that the tea clipper ship of the British, the Scarborough, ran aground in 1748. And of course, they knew about the famous map of Father Pedro Murillo Velarde of 1734. So Alessandro Malaspina went to Scarborough Show and conducted a hydrographic survey. He made deaf soundings by dropping stone that's uh, attached to rope so they could measure the depths. And this is the first hydrographic survey ever of Scarborough Shoal, 1792, and it was done by, by the Spaniards. And so clearly uh, Scarborough Shoal is quite a Philippine territory. No earlier hydrographic survey was ever made by China. Uh, in 1899, when the Americans came here, the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1898. So the Americans came here and they published a map of the Philippines, their first map of the Philippines. This is the first map of the Philippines under this American regime. You can see on the upper left portion, United States Geodetic and Coast Survey. This map was published in Washington, D.C. in 1899. And it shows Scarborough Shoal as part of Philippine territory. So the Americans recognize that Scarborough Shore is part of Philippine territory. That's the first map that they made. And in 1938, the Commonwealth government of the Philippines, uh, the Commonwealth was run by Filipinos. And the Filipinos in the Commonwealth government at the time were worried that some country might claim Scarborough Shore. 
So they wrote the Secretary of State, Secretary Colonel Hall, to ask if they could put up a lighthouse on Scarborough Shoal. But the question was, was Scarborough Shoal part of Philippine territory? So they asked Secretary Colonel Hall to answer the question whether Scarborough Shoal is part of Philippine territory. And Secretary Colonel wrote a memorandum of July 27, 1938. And he said, nobody has claimed Scarborough Shoal because of the absence of other claims, the show should be regarded as included among the islands ceded to the United States by the Spanish, American Spanish Treaty of November 7, 1900. That's the Treaty of Washington of 1900. So the Secretary of State in an official document said Scarborough Shore is part of the territory ceded by Spain in the Treaty of Washington of November 7, 1900. The Secretary of State interposed no objection to the proposal of the Commonwealth government to study the possibility of putting up an aid to ocean navigation. That was the lighthouse. So the Filipinos in the Commonwealth government had the foresight. They, have a, they had a very good foresight. They knew, they were worried that someone, some country might claim Scarborough Shore and they wanted to stake our sovereignty by putting up a lighthouse there. Now, China has made other claims. You know, China claimed the South China Sea, the Nine Dash Line, and that has been debunked. The arbitral tribunal said there is no basis in law or in fact that China can claim the waters and resources within the Nine Dash Line. That uh, historical Nine Dash claim has no basis in fact. There are no records at all to support that. And the law doesn't support that. But China has also made other false claims about the South China Sea. First, China said the Cairo Declaration of November 27, 1943 declared that the Spatis and the Paracels should be returned to China after the Japanese defeated in World War II. The Cairo Declaration was issued by President Roosevelt with the U.S., Prime Minister Winston Churchill of U.K. and President Chiang Kai-shek of China. They met in Cairo to determine what to do with the territories that uh, Japan seized during the two world wars. And the China is now claiming that in that Cairo declaration, uh, the three leaders agreed to award the Spratlys and the Paracels uh, to China. So this is false, and I will prove that. The second false claim of China is that in the Potsdam Declaration of 1945, uh, among President Truman, uh, Prime Minister Churchill and Chiang Kai-shek of China, they agreed to award the parcels and the spatlies to China. That's false again, and I will prove that. The third false claim of China is that in the 1951 San Francisco Peace Conference that finally settled World War with respect to Japan, the parties to the peace conference agreed to award the parcels and the spatlies to China. That's a false claim. So let's go to the Cairo Conference. The Cairo Conference produced the Cairo Declaration, and the Cairo Declaration specifically stated, number two, all territories Japan has stolen from the Chinese, including Manchuria, Formosa, shall be restored to the Republic of China. There was no mention of the Spratlys or Paracels. Now, why? Because Japan seized the Paracels from the French, not from the Chinese. The French were the ones who occupied the parasols when Japan seized the parasols. As to the Spratlys, no country occupied the Spratlys when Japan put up a submarine base in Ituaba in 1939. That submarine base was used in the invasion of the Philippines. So the Spratlys were unoccupied by any country when Japan seized the Spratlys. So it was not stolen from China. In fact, in the 1943 handbook that uh, you've seen in the video lecture, in 1943, China, under the, the, under the Kuomintang government, never claimed the Spratlys as part of its territory. So very clear, the Cairo Conference did not award the Spratlys or the Parasols to China. Now, the Potsdam Declaration merely reiterated the Cairo Declaration. The Potsdam Declaration said the terms of the Cairo Declaration shall be carried out and the Japanese sovereignty shall be limited to the islands of 
Honshu, Hokkaido, Kyushu, Shikuku, and such other minor islands. There was no award of the Paracels for this practice to China. Then we go to the San Francisco Peace Conference of 1951. China, in fact, denounced the San Francisco Peace Treaty as illegal because China was not represented. There was an ongoing civil war when the San Francisco Peace Treaty started and none of them, none of the parties to the civil war was represented. And so the People's Republic of China, when the Communists finally won in 1949, uh, they denounced the Treaty of San Francisco. And in that peace conference in San Francisco, the USSR made a motion to award the Paracelsus practice to China. And this motion was put to a vote and what it was overwhelmingly defeated by a vote of 46 to three with one abstention. And so the San Francisco Peace Conference expressly rejected to award the Spratlys and the Paracels to China. So with that, that wraps up my uh, additional uh, points to my video lecture. And uh, I will now answer your questions. Thank you. Many of you sent uh, the questions uh, earlier. Can you start uh, asking uh, the, the question, Lori? Last week, President Duterte finally declared before the UN General Assembly his agreement with the arbitral ruling, whereas for years he was against it. Would this change, this back and forth, affect the ruling itself? Would it be stopped? And can we ask the UN to enforce it? Actually, the uh, the ruling is still there, it's enforceable, and uh, unless it's expressly waived or impliedly waived, and uh, we have been very careful every time that the president uh, walks into dangerous grounds uh, that he might be impliedly waiving our arbitral ruling. We, I have uh, spoken out and uh, expressed to everyone that uh, they should clarify what he said so that there will be no claim later on by China that uh, the president has implied to waive the ruling. And so far, we have been successful uh, in preserving the arbitral ruling that there is no waiver because the arbitral ruling will remain there forever unless waived expressly or impliedly by the Philippine government. And in the Philippine government, it is the president who can waive it under international law. So far, there's been a waiver. Uh, we have been successful. And uh, recently, the president surprised us by, by asserting the arbitral ruling before the United Nations General Assembly. It was a pleasant surprise uh, that uh, he finally uh, told the world that he will not compromise. There will be no compromise whatsoever on our uh, arbitral victory at The Hague. Uh, but the question is, will the president walk the talk? So we have asked the president that this policy that he announced before the world community should be uh, applied across all fronts, on all levels, in our negotiations, in the code of conduct, in our uh, protection uh, of the West Philippine Sea, we send patrols to our exclusive economic zone because the resources within our exclusive economic zone belong to us. The constitution says that the state must protect its marine wealth in its exclusive economic zone. And also, we should use the same policy when we gather the support of uh, the international community because the international community will not uh, support uh, the ruling if we don't ask for their support. In fact, very I'm very surprised that even without a formal uh, request by the Philippine government, UK, France, and Germany came out strongly after the US uh, and Australia came out, strongly saying the arbitral ruling must be respected uh, by China. Uh, China must uh, uh, honor the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines and the West Philippine Sea. Even without our asking them, they've done it. Uh, and we're, I'm very grateful for that because our president refused to, to ask them to support us. But finally, the president appeared at the United Nations General Assembly and said, yes, we will not compromise. Uh, so we must move from that and ask the support of the world community because 
uh, it is the support of the world community that will put pressure on China to respect international law. China needs the world because to survive, China needs to export, China needs to import to survive, and it cannot ignore world opinion. And uh, we cannot go to the United Nations Security Council uh, to enforce the ruling because China has a veto there. So we can only go to the UN General Assembly where world opinion is expressed. It's the locus of world opinion because in the General Assembly, all the countries of the world are represented. And uh, when we ask them to support a resolution, that is an expression of opinion of the world. And that is a moral situation on China because that is how Nicaragua did it when Nicaragua was fighting the US. And that is how Mauritius did it recently when Mauritius was fighting the UK. And they, Mauritius and UK, very small countries won over uh, nuclear armed countries. So we have to do the same thing because we need the support of the international community. Thank you. So just to clarify, Justice, this ruling is permanent. It's like forever. Uh, is there a deadline for its execution? And if uh, the government flip-flops, are we in danger of losing our claim? Yes, it, it will remain there. Uh, uh, it cannot be reversed except by our own action, expressed or implied. And the forum for this action would be the UN General Assembly? Yes, uh, because uh, China is a nuclear armed power. We cannot use force mm -hmm. to enforce the ruling that's against our own constitution. That's also against the UN Charter. So we, ask, we have to ask the support of the international community. Um, the uh, international tribunal uh, ruling uh, is part already of uh, international law. I think his question is, can the United Nations reverse that, uh, uh, the UN General Assembly, uh, again? Uh, yes, thank you, Joey. Uh, the, when we bring, when we file a resolution before the UN General Assembly, the resolution will state, China must comply with international law. China must comply with the ruling. And the members of the UN will be asked to vote on that. That China should be made to comply with the arbitral ruling. Mm -hmm. Now, I expect a majority at least to approve that. But assuming that the majority will not approve that, uh, what is the effect? Nothing. Because that is just world opinion. World opinion cannot reverse international law. And uh, the uh, the, the ruling will stand. We, we, we are just going to the army, to the UN General Assembly to ask for their support to enforce the ruling, not to reverse it. And even if they vote against it, it is not a reversal of the ruling. They are just saying, we don't want to join you in enforcing it. Do it your own way. Don't involve us. That is the effect because that resolution is non-binding. It is not legally binding on anyone. It is just an expression of support. That's the legal status of that ruling, of that uh, resolution one, if it is approved. Approved or disapproved, it is not legally binding. It just has moral force. So it is not a reversal of the ruling, even if the uh, UN uh, General Assembly will not approve it. It is just an expression of uh, non-support of the ruling. <laughs> That's not reversible. Thank you. President Duterte has often said that he already has a personal agreement with the president of China, Xi Jinping. Is his personal agreement with the president of China legal and binding on our country? Well, uh, the president said that uh, he allowed China to fish in our exclusive economic zone to a verbal agreement but with President Xi Jinping, but we have not uh, heard from uh, China. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the Senate, our Senate, uh, has uh, asked the President to uh, 
uh, inform the Senate about this agreement because such an agreement is actually a treaty. Before it can be enforced, it has to be ratified by the Senate because that is giving a privilege to a country to fish in our exclusive economic zone. The exclusive economic zone, it's called exclusive because the right to exploit the fish there, the natural resources there, belongs exclusively to the Philippines, the adjacent coastal state. But the Philippine president said he made a side agreement with China, verbal. Well, he must submit that to the Senate for ratification. Otherwise, that's void under the Constitution. But the Senate dropped that investigation, and uh, the president has not mentioned it again. But China has not also confirmed it and has not raised it. But what China has raised uh, through its uh, ambassador recently is that uh, President Xi Jinping and uh, President agreed to shelve the dispute and just to cooperate on trade and investment. Well, shelving the dispute is not waiving it because you can put it aside. In other words, you can raise it at some future date. And uh, there was a time when the president arrived from this visit. From, uh, he arrived uh, from Singapore. And uh, on his arrival at uh, the Davao airport, he announced that he was setting aside the arbitral ruling yeah. in favor of trade and investments. Uh, I immediately talked to the DFA, our foreign affairs people, that they have to clarify that statement because in law, when you say set aside, you mean you mean to reverse it. So when the Supreme Court says in its ruling, we set aside the order of the lower court, that means we reverse, we abandon, we revoke. And when the president said, I am setting aside the arbitral ruling, he is saying that he is abandoning the arbitral ruling. And then the international law, that will bind us if China accepts it. So I immediately contacted the DFA people that they have to clarify that what the president meant was he was putting it aside, not setting it aside, putting it aside and raise it at the appropriate time in the future, not to waive it, but to just put it aside. And fortunately, the DFA people issued a clarification immediately before China could react. DFA said, uh, the president was not abandoning. He, he would raise it at some future time. And uh, they beat China because after four hours after the clarification by our DFA people, China came out with a statement gladly accepting, thanking Duterte for that uh, statement. But we were able to clarify. So that international doctrine of unilateral declaration by heads of state bind the state cannot apply because we were able to clarify it. We did not abandon the ruling. So we have been very careful in watching, uh, monitoring what the president will say so that there'll be no waiver. And happily, when he made that statement before the UN General Council, finally asserting before the world community that there is no compromise, no transitory government can change that, that will stay there forever. And that clarifies everything. The question now is, will he walk the talk? Thank you. And his record for uh, you know, walking the talk has hardly been admirable. Is there anything we can do to encourage the president to walk the talk since he has already started off in that direction? Secretary Teddy Boyloxin said that in the negotiations for the Code of Conduct, he will insist that the arbitral ruling be included. That's very good. We have to make that position because if the arbitral ruling is not included, China will say, look, everybody signed the code of conduct and the Philippines signed it and there is no mention of the arbitral ruling. So that arbitral ruling is now superseded by this code of conduct. We don't want China to say that. So to prevent China from saying that, we will insist that the code of conduct be mentioned in the, in the, uh, that the arbitral ruling be mentioned in the code of conduct. And that's very important. So uh, we have to insist on that. And uh, 
unfortunately, uh, Secretary Loxin has taken that position and we have to support him. Thank you. So you clearly believe that this is a long haul. Uh, what is your opinion on the idea of joint development, joint ownership, or some kind of joint venture arrangement in that area? Because while we own it, we have a claim to it, the Chinese are there. Uh, that's a very good question. We have to distinguish between joint development and joint cooperation. Uh, I am against joint development or joint venture because uh, we cannot share the implication of joint development is that the sovereign rights are shared. We have exclusive sovereign rights in our exclusive economic zone. We're talking here of uh, getting the gas in Ruid Bank. And uh, I am against joint development because of the implication that we are sharing our sovereign rights. Mm -hmm. But there is a thing uh, uh, called cooperation, or joint cooperation. And uh, that is structured through the service contract. So I support that. Uh, the difference is that <clears throat> uh, recently, the uh, Last 2019, the Philippines and China signed a memorandum of understanding to jointly cooperate in exploring, exploiting gas. What is the meaning of that? In that memorandum of understanding, it is clear that China and the Philippines will uh, implement the MOU through the service contract that we have. Uh, in our yeah. service contract, like in Malampaya, the uh, Philippine government gave a service contract, signed a service contract with Shell, for Shell to extract gas, and for the services of Shell, the Philippines will pay Shell 40% of the net proceeds in oil or in cash, in gas or in cash. So in that service contract, the first whereas clause says, whereas the gas belongs to the Philippine government. The Philippine government has rights, sovereign rights to the gas. So there is an express acknowledgement in the service contract that the Philippine government has sovereign rights. And if we enter into a contract with China based on this service contract, then we are ahead. China would have impliedly agreed that we have sovereign rights. We have nothing to lose, everything to gain. So that is the meaning of the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, and I supported that. And happily, uh, China agreed. And from the MOU, there was a terms of reference that was signed to implement the MOU. And the third phase was supposed to be an agreement between uh, China National Offshore Company, a state-owned company of China doing commercial activities, and Forum Energy, our service contractor in Reed Bank. So Sinuk will become a subcontractor of Forum Energy or maybe buy equity into Forum Energy. And we will allow that because that's a private transaction and that impliedly recognizes, China impliedly recognizes there that we have sovereign rights. So why is China agreeing to that? Because uh, that that in effect uh, means that China recognizes our sovereign rights. The way I look at it is China is looking for a solution, a permanent solution to the South China Sea dispute because there is that arbitral ruling. It cannot be this, it cannot be changed anymore. And other countries, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, are using the arbitral ruling. So China is trying to get as much as it can out of the of a bad situation. So China is saying. Make us your service contractor. We get 40%, you get 60, and we will be happy. And the Chinese have told the Vietnamese, wait for the memo you in terms of reference and the, the next agreement to be finalized between China and the Philippines because we can enter into the same agreement with you, with the Vietnamese. And so I think China is looking at this as a South China Sea-wide uh, solution to the dispute so that China can say, well, uh, we have been kind to our neighbors. We, 
we gave them 60%, but we have 40% of everything, which is huge. And that's the way I look at it. Uh, now, whether China will continue, I'm not yet sure, because we are so we were supposed to meet, Sinuk and the uh, forum manager were supposed to meet last February, but uh, COVID intervened, so there was no meeting. And uh, China's turned very aggressive now in the South China Sea. Maybe they think they have the upper hand, they might change their mind, I do not know. So uh, we will wait and see, but there is a solution. There is a light at the end of the tunnel and China's made very clear steps towards this, which will respect our sovereign rights and China will benefit also. It will be a win-win and the China in effect will just be dislodging the Western <clears throat> companies like Shell, but uh, we will not allow China to monopolize everything to get all the contracts. We will also give some of the contracts to other, uh, to other uh, 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 enterprises, Western companies. But of course, uh, we have to, it will be good for us to give uh, Sinuk a big part because that will settle everything. But it is no skin off our back. We do not give them more than what the Western companies are getting now. And yet we settle the dispute. And <clears throat> I see this as the ultimate solution. But unfortunately, COVID intervened, and I do not know whether China has changed its mind. So we are in the cusp of a solution to this problem. We must stay the course. We must insist that we have sovereign rights. And uh, we will insist on the ruling. Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, they are now using the ruling also, especially or impliedly. And so China will be faced with a common position by all the other ASEAN coastal states. So that is the situation now. And uh, <clears throat> with Secretary Loxin insisting that the code of conduct uh, include the arbitral ruling, that strengthens our position. And uh, Secretary Loxin also insisted that the code of conduct will not exclude outside powers like the US, UK, France, Australia from conducting freedom of navigation and uh, over flight operations because these operations actually enforce the arbitral ruling. Thank you. So long as uh, the arbitral ruling is uh, is recognized, therefore our our sovereignty is recognized. Is that correct? Yes, uh, the arbitral ruling is the foundation. Mm -hmm. We must build on it, and we must not waver because. That is international law, and China cannot uh, destroy that anymore as long as we do not waive the ruling expressly or impliedly. And other countries have latched on. Mm -hmm. Out of the blue, US, UK, France, and Germany came out on their own. We did not ask them because they want international law to be applied in the South China Sea because they realize that if China can seize almost 90% of the South China Sea as its own, then UNCLOS, the law of the sea will collapse. And what will rule in the oceans and seas of our planet will be the naval canon. To protect your maritime zone, you do not need the law. You need warships, warplanes, and missiles, and nuclear bombs. And that will be very costly. There will be a naval arms race, and money intended for social services, for education, will be diverted to buy warships and warplanes, and everybody will, will lose. So the Western powers understand that the arbitrary ruling must be enforced, otherwise the law of the sea will collapse. Thank you. Will the tribunal ruling have any effect on our situation in uh, the Benham Rice? And what about our claim on Sabah? On Benham Rice, uh, that's a different issue because the arbitral ruling applies only to the West Philippine Sea. Uh, I see. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the principles, the legal principles are the same. Uh, but it's a different issue. We did not include the Benham Rice because China has not claimed it, not yet anyway. 
on the Saba, uh, I have explained that uh, our claim to Saba, the territory of Saba, uh, is not affected by the South China Sea dispute because the territory of the Sultan of Sulu uh, never faced the South China Sea. The territory of ah. Sultan of Sulu faced the Sulu Sea and the Celebes Sea. It did not have any territory facing the South China Sea. So the territory of the Sultan of Sulu has no claim to waters or maritime zones facing the South China Sea. So uh, there is no overlap. Uh, uh, that I have clarified that if you look at all the maps, uh, the uh, 18th and 19th century maps uh, of the territory of the Sultan of Sulu, the territory of the Sultan of Sulu never faced the South China Sea. So there is no overlap at all. There is no uh, uh, overlap of the dispute. So we can completely separate the Saba claim from the uh, West Philippine Sea District. When I speak of West Philippine Sea, I refer to the body of water where we have sovereignty or sovereign rights. That means the West Philippine Sea is the body of water comprising our territory of sea, our exclusive economic zone, and extended continental shelf. So it is just a part of the bigger sea. The bigger sea is the South China Sea. I want to raise the issue of nationalism in this matter. When in the large po political and economic considerations often take precedence in handling territorial disputes. Does this not weaken the matter of nationalism? No, I, I don't think it weakens uh, our nationalism uh, because uh, if right now Shell is taking the gas in Malampaya, uh, we're paying Shell 40%. Uh, what will happen here is that another company will just take over the position of Shell and it doesn't matter to us because that company will always recognize we have sovereign rights. Uh, the, we have to, because that's how the industry works. They, even our company, uh, the group of Mane Pangilinan enters into a joint uh, uh, venture with other companies abroad so that they can pool their resources, their capital to exploit the, to extract the gas. But that's okay because that is governed by the service contract. Uh, our constitution allows, uh, allows foreign participation in the exploitation of natural resources up to 40%. So there's not no problem there. That's in accordance with the constitution. Um, yes, Senator. Will it be a good uh, move to get in touch with uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations in other ASEAN countries and uh, other countries uh, that they may show interest in uh, upholding the uh, international uh, uh, tribunal's uh, decision so that uh, these uh, non-governmental organizations uh, in these countries can communicate uh, and relay their position with their uh, respective government and therefore uh, apply, applying uh, pressure or uh, encouragement on the leadership of those countries to pursue uh, to its logical conclusion the uh, uh, international uh, uh, tribunal ruling. Yes, that would be a very good idea. Uh, in fact, we can start with something that's not so controversial. Uh, the uh, the, the Spratlys are the breeding ground of fish in the South China Sea because that is where the fish spawn. That's where they lay their eggs and the, a lar and the egg and larvae of fish that spawn in the Spratlys are carried by currents all over the South China Sea to the coast of Luzon, coast of China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia. And uh, without the Spratlys, the, you will not get as much fish as you can as you have now in the South China Sea. And more than 200 million people depend on fish from the South China Sea for their protein. So we need the Spratlys to be preserved as the breeding ground of fish. 
And that means the environment, the marine environment should be preserved. The atolls should not be destroyed because it is in these atoll reefs where the fish breed, where they lay their eggs. So uh, one suggestion, and I, I agree with this, is that uh, the Spatley should be declared a marine protected area, which was uh, 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 advocated by uh, uh, marine biologists. Uh, and we should preserve the Spratlys as a marine protected area because that is where we get our fish in the South China Sea. So environmental groups in the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, should lobby their government that individually in these countries will declare whatever they possess in the Spratlys as marine protected area. We possess, for example, uh, nine biologic creatures there, uh, about nine, and we will declare them as marine protected area, including, let's say, uh, three to six nautical miles uh, from surrounding those geologic features that will be enough to protect the marine environment. So we declare it as a marine protected area. Vietnam will declare their area. The, uh, Malaysia will declare their area. And China will be forced to follow suit because China today is the biggest beneficiary of fish in the South China Sea. China takes more than 50% of the annual fish catch in the South China Sea. And their, their percentage of fish catch is growing because as they become richer, their people demand more fish on the table. And uh, so they are scooping more fish every year from the South China Sea than they would do the previous year. So they're the number one beneficiary if we preserve the spatlys as a marine protected area for the fish to spawn. So this movement of environmentalists can uh, uh, encourage uh, their governments to declare individually. And once all the governments have declared, the governments can enter into a, a convention where the spatlys will be managed uh, by the representatives of these governments. Now, uh, there is a example to this. Uh, when Jordan and uh, Israel signed a peace treaty, uh, there was a patch of water in the Red Sea where they could not agree who owns it. So they just declared it a marine protected area. They jointly managed it. And it's very successful. So one resolution of the territorial dispute in the South China Sea, because there are two disputes, territorial dispute and the maritime dispute. The maritime dispute has been settled uh, by the arbitral ruling, but the territorial dispute has not been because it's not part of the UNCLOS ruling. The territorial dispute can be frozen by declaring uh, the Spratlys as a marine protected area. For the next, let's say 50 to 100 years, let it be a marine protected area. We suspend all, the, all territorial claims as a marine protected area, we benefit from it because we need the fish in the South China Sea to spawn there in the, the spatlys. And because of sea level rise, the projection is that by the end of the century, uh, most of the geologic features and all of the artificial islands of China in the South in the spatlys will be submerged by sea level rise, which will be about two meters high. So. Once these geologic features and artificial islands are submerged, they will form part of our exclusive economic zone. So the territorial dispute will be resolved by nature because the sea level rise will be very high uh, in the next 100 years. So we can just freeze the territorial conflict for the next 100 years. Nature will resolve that. In the meantime, we have settled the, arbitra the maritime dispute in our favor. That will be there forever. We have 200 nautical miles easy in the uh, West Philippine Sea. So that should be our approach. Get all the parties to agree to preserve, to make the Spratlys as a marine protected area. China has to agree because it's to their benefit. They will be the number one beneficiary if the fish stop in the South China is preserved. But over time, we'll be the winner because of sea level rise. 
So that's the way I look at it. Thank you. There have been reports that you are involved in the filing of an international lawsuit along with Ombudsman Conchita Morales and Secretary Albert Del Rosario, an international lawsuit against Chinese President Xi Jinping. How is this related to your action on the tribunal ruling? Well, uh, I have entered my appearance as a counsel of uh, uh, Ombudsman uh, Conchita Morales and uh, Secretary Albert De Rosario. Uh, how is that case related to the arbitral ruling? Uh, the arbitral ruling made a find, there is a finding there, there's finding a fact by the tribunal that China caused severe and permanent damage to the marine ecosystem in this practice. That's right. By destroying at least seven atoll reefs and converting it into artificial islands. How huge is that? What is the magnitude of destroying seven atoll reefs in this practice? We are very proud of Tubata. It's a World Heritage Site in the Sulu Sea, but Tubata has only two atoll reefs. Only two atoll reefs. Here in the Spratlys, China destroyed at least seven because they created seven artificial islands. And from my information, China also destroyed at least three other atoll reefs to get filling materials from these other atoll reefs. Mm -hmm. So that's why the tribunal said, China caused severe and permanent damage to the marine ecosystem in this practice. Now, since over 200 million people depend on fish from the South China Sea for their protein, and thousands of Filipinos and other foreigners depend on fishing in the South China Sea for their livelihood. The destruction of that coral ecosystem in the Spratlys is a crime against humanity under the Charter of the International Criminal Court because that is a destruction of uh, the environment causing damage and uh, uh, suffering to a huge number of people. And uh, this is recognized in the policy statement issued by the prosecutor of the ICC. And that's why we filed that. Now, so because that is also a message to China not to reclaim Scarborough Shoal because we will file another case. If China, because Scarborough Shoal is an atoll reef also. If China will destroy the atoll reef there and create an artificial island, we will file another case because that is a crime against humanity also. So the case that we filed against President Xi Jinping, and now we included also, uh, I'm one of the counsels there, we included also the uh, top two officers of China Communications Construction Company the company that did the dredging in the Spratlys and is now and will now do the dredging in Cavite uh, to create that uh, 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 the new Cavite airport uh, with the Cavite uh, provincial government. We have included the, the chairman and the president of uh, this Chinese company in the uh, case for violation of uh, for committing a crime against humanity. So this is a message to China. Do not destroy Scarborough Shoal, and we will also hold you up to account for what you have done. So because our government is not doing anything to prevent China from doing more reclamation, the government decided to set aside, to put aside the ruling. So we, as private citizens, have been thinking, how do we protect? How do we deter China from reclaiming Scarborough Shoal? So we decided on this case. So this lawsuit is entirely in your capacity as private citizens. It is not the government that is filing suit against Xi Jinping. It is, yes, uh, it, the, the, the complaint has been filed by uh, Secretary Albert Desario and Ombudsman Conchita uh, 
Carpio Morales. I'm one of the councils. Uh, I I've entered my appearance as a council uh, because I'm now retired. Uh, I can do it as a private citizen. These are all initiatives of private citizens because our government has not done anything. The government has decided to do nothing to, so that it can secure <laughs> loans and investments from China. Those loans and investments are not coming anymore. The Duterte administration has less than two years in office. And so far, less than 5% of those loans and investments have materialized. The promise was a, about 24 billion US dollars in loans and investments. That's less than what they have delivered was less than 5%. And there are no more tourists from China who are coming because of a pandemic. The Pogos are closing shop because China decided to stop uh, the outflow of foreign currency. This China's economy is experiencing also a problem. And the Pogos are a source of illegal outflow of uh, dollars from China. And that's why China is now canceling all the passports of those Pogo workers. And so there's nothing to expect from China. The Duterte administration has been taken for a ride, freezing the arbitral ruling, hoping to get something, but none of those things are going to materialize anymore. Um, the other question, um, how can China be dislodged given their structures already built there? So uh, it's a question of enforce, enforcement. And if illegal acts had been committed, how can they be... Uh, uh, what correction can be made, like uh, damages, payment, yeah, dislodging or uh, destroying the structures that they built? Uh, how, how do you look at this, uh, Justice? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the how do we hold China to account? Well, we have brought a case against the Chinese leadership and the companies that destroyed the atoll reefs legend company and uh, we I have suggested to the Duterte administration we can also file a, another case before UNCLOS because China up to now refuses to give us full rights for a fisherman to fish in Scarborough Shore. remember the tribunal said uh, the ruling says uh, the Filipinos the Vietnamese and the Chinese have common fishing rights in Scarborough Shoal, that means within the territorial sea of Scarborough Shoal. But China refuses to allow our fishermen to fish inside the lagoon of Scarborough Shoal, which is huge. That's about 154 uh, hectares. Uh, we cannot fish there, uh, and uh, we are being driven out. Uh, the Chinese are allowed to fish inside, so there's discrimination. We can file a case before the uh, uh, Uncle's tribunal that the rules of fishing there must be agreed upon because nobody should be allowed to overfish because the fishing must be sustainable because uh, otherwise uh, the, the fish stock will be depleted. So there has to be a quota for each country uh, what they can get and uh, uh, this must be laid down. Uh, we, we cannot be prevented from entering uh, the lagoon. Uh, there should be uh, common rules because it's a common fishing ground. Therefore, there must be common rules. Right now, it's China just decides everything. So we can go to the Ampas Tribunal and demand that China pay our fishermen damages for preventing our fishermen from fully exercising their rights to fish in the China Sea in the Scarborough Shoal. So, we can do that on, on other things. China has been swarming our territorial sea in Pagasa. They have been, uh, their, their maritime militias have been there. We can bring China to an uncle's tribunal because that's in violation of our territorial sea. China has been fishing in the exclusive economic zone. That's why that ship that, uh, that, uh, that rammed January, the Chinese ship was fishing. And it has no right to be there because that is our exclusive economic zone. So we can demand damages from China for that. So we can bring this, but then we need an administration that's willing to do it. That's a big problem. But there are many legal ways. Uh, 
of uh, holding China to account. The ICC case is one, because in that ICC case, there will be damages that will be assessed against the dredging company, against the uh, individuals, uh, president and the chairman of the dredging company. Aside from uh, imprisonment, there are civil uh, damages. So there are many ways to do it, but you need an administration that will do it. You need a political will from the government in the Philippines to do it. If we will like give uh, Justice Carpe a bit of rest, maybe a uh, humor, what do you see as new approaches on taking law as a career? And also uh, <laughs> law students who struggle with mental health conditions, but still doing their best to pursue their passion and dream of becoming a lawyer, even in these conditions. I know, you know, uh, that even during the time of uh, martial law, a lot of law students were discouraged because uh, law was being uh, made by executive order rather than by legislation. So uh, I don't know in that state, but a lot of people are discouraged and the law students would like your opinion or encouragement. Well, I too, when I was taking up law, I was in the second year, uh, law school in UP College of Law when martial law was declared and you know, it looked like the world has changed. It has turned upside down where there was no more Congress to enact law. Uh, the Supreme Court was under the thumb of the president. It was a one-man rule and the, the rule of law cannot be uh, made by just one man, cannot be enforced by one man. So, but then you have to look at it from a historical perspective. That too will pass and uh, the law evolves gradually. Uh, we have now the, the UNCLOS, the UN Convention of the Law, this is considered to be the highest achievement of man in developing a legal system. Because in UNCLOS, you have here uh, a complete body of law and you have uh, an, a rulemaking power of the tribunal to settle disputes, mandatory uh, settlement of disputes among the those who ratified, those who are members of the participants to the convention. So it's the highest achievement of man, but one thing is lacking, enforcement. So law has to develop again. And uh, uh, the result of all of this, this dispute with China, the lack of uh, legal mechanism to enforce will one day be addressed maybe by the next generation of lawyers or the generation after that because law evolves over time uh, and it evolves because of the experience of people. Uh, our experience now in dealing with China will have an impact on the development of law. So do not be worried about this pandemic or whatever, because these are just hiccups. We've been through worse times, we've been through martial law, and uh, do not be discouraged uh, because the law will continue to evolve. The law will always be there because without law, there will be chaos. So uh, first, congratulations, and thank you very much for holding this. I, I think this is really a, uh, one matter that is very important that requires everybody's participation. Uh, Justice Tony, are you using any estimate of our biodiverse marine wealth in the WPS? Uh, and unless we can, uh, we know and can measure what we have, it will be difficult for us to manage it. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Cora. The UP Institute of Marine Science uh, actually uh, had a preliminary evaluation of the loss that we are suffering because of what China did uh, in the Spratlys, their dredging of the atoll reefs and the the Asian of artificial islands and the, uh, our marine scientists, new team marine scientists, who, uh, have estimated uh, the damage to be uh, 32 billion pesos a year. That's a conservative estimate. That's only for what China has done uh, in uh, the Spratlys. Uh, that's not the value of the resources that we have in the West Philippine Sea, but that is the 
damage that our fishermen are suffering, 32 billion uh, pesos a year. So I would welcome uh, a thorough evaluation of our uh, natural resources in the West Philippine Sea, evaluation of the fish, the oil, gas, and other mineral resources. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that area uh, is larger than the total land area of the Philippines. The total land area of the Philippines is about 300,000 square kilometers. The area that China is encroaching on our exclusive economic zone is a little over 300,000 square kilometers. So larger than our total land area. And we must quantify what we are going to lose should China succeed in seizing our exclusive economic zone so that our people will have an idea what we will lose. And uh, the UP Science Institute uh, can probably work on this. Uh, we must remember that there are other natural resources, mineral resources that are yet to be uh, uh, discovered or, or commercialized in the West Philippine Sea. You have what is known as the uh, uh, methane hydrates, which I explained in my video lecture. There are methane hydrates in uh, the West Philippine Sea, and I think there are more in the West Philippine Sea than in the rest of the South China Sea, because we have the deeper portion of the South China Sea because of the Manila Trench. So I think uh, our scientists, economists, should uh, join together in getting an estimate of the value of our natural resources in the West Philippine Sea. Thank you. It looks like this issue will take time. A quick scan of the participants to this webinar uh, show a majority are baby boomers and Gen X. What actions can we take to inform and involve the younger generation in protecting our sovereignty? I, I thought this was a rhetorical question, <laughs> better addressed to ourselves, no? We have children, we have grandchildren. Uh, I think it, um, I hope you don't mind if I answer this uh, uh, justice, no? Share with them the knowledge that uh, we just uh, got from this uh, uh, webinar. And then uh, NGOs uh, in the country, um, okay, there are many uh, movements now. Um, I'm uh, receiving a lot of uh, invitations from them for uh, NGOs to get together, the private groups to get together. And one of the major planks of this uh, group or movement that is uh, a burning uh, will be national uh, sovereignty and territorial uh, integrity. And our guru on this issue will uh, always be Justice, uh, Justice Carpio. Now, uh, I'd like to say something about the, uh, the need for our youth to, to be involved. Uh, this battle with China, this struggle. I call this an intergenerational struggle because China will not just uh, surrender, will not just give up. China is a nuclear power, is the military hegemon in our region, so it will fight back. And this battle with China will take generations. Our generation, my generation has established the foundation. We have that arbitral ruling. So every succeeding generation must build on this arbitral ruling. And to build on that arbitral ruling, we must be thoroughly familiar with the issues and the facts. And that's why I have compiled all the historical data that I could gather so that the next generation can build on that. Because we have to address this issue to the Chinese people. The Chinese government has been teaching their people from grade school to college that they owned the South China Sea since 2000 years ago. So the Chinese people sincerely believe that they own the South China Sea. But this historical narrative is totally false. Now, we cannot expect the Chinese government to comply with the arbitral ruling because they have taught the Chinese, the Chinese people a different historical narrative. They cannot say, oh, we were wrong. We, will talk, we taught you something false. They cannot do that. So the task of educating the Chinese people falls on us and the rest of the world. So we must be familiar with the historical facts and 
inform everybody, our ASEAN neighbors, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, and the rest of the world. These are the historical facts backed up by the arbitral ruling. Let's inform the Chinese people so that the Chinese people will become ashamed to assert the historical narrative that they own the South China Sea since 2000 years ago. The Chinese people are good people, basically good people, just like the Filipinos, like the rest of the peoples of the world. The only problem is they've been taught only one historical narrative, and that historical narrative happened to be totally false. So we have to open their eyes. The problem is there is a Chinese wall. We cannot, my book, this webinar cannot be watched in China. But before COVID, about 100 million Chinese people go out of China to travel as tourists. And outside of China, they have access to the internet. And that is our opportunity to inform the Chinese people. So this webinar and webinars like this will educate us, will equip us with the knowledge to converse with the Chinese people on the history of the South China Sea. Thank you. It is generally accepted that the present administration is hardly proactive on this matter. What can we do as citizens, either individually or as a group, to maintain the momentum that you have already set and to express how we value our sovereignty? What can we do? Well, uh, first we should, be, we should familiarize ourselves with the facts and the issues. Second, we should converse among ourselves Third, we should converse with our neighbors, with the Malaysians, Vietnamese, Indonesians, and next, we should converse with the rest of the world. And we should uh, express our opinion in Facebook, in YouTube, uh, that we do not agree with just doing nothing with the arbitral ruling. We do not agree with what the president has done so far. We want the president to be more assertive and uh, we want to have a convention with Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, that uh, the, the spatlies be made into a marine protected area. We can generate a, a popular movement among the people, among NGOs. Let's concentrate on declaring the spatlies a marine protected area. There is a bill now pending in Congress to declare uh, to authorize the president to declare the Spratlys as a marine protected area. Let's push for that. And also, there are also groups in Vietnam who are for it. NGOs in Vietnam who want to declare the Spratlys as a marine protected area. Also in Malaysia. So let us join forces with everyone in ASEAN. And I think that's a very powerful movement because in the West, that's a powerful issue protection of the marine environment. Let's latch on to that. Because in the territorial dispute, we are ahead. Remember, sea level rise will submerge all of this. And once submerged, that will form part of our exclusive economic zone. The maritime dispute has been settled. We're now left with the territorial dispute. Let's convert the territorial dispute into a marine protected area where everybody can agree. That, uh... <laughs> matter of organizing uh, i think will be uh, very much uh, alive in our minds right now because we cannot just be 50 100 200 300 we have to reach out to as many number of people uh, particular or especially on this issue of uh, national uh, sovereignty and territorial uh, integrity well thank you very much maraming maraming salamat uh, justice tony carpio palakpakan natin si <laughs> Si Justice, mabuhay ka. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we want to thank especially the students from the University of USC.